assistance with it! After fighting through countless hordes of peons and becoming comfortable with the game's various mechanics, boss fights serve as milestones through which players can judge how far they have progressed. Due to this, boss encounters come in all shapes and sizes. But one thing is almost always consistent. They represent a significant step up in terms of difficulty. This can come from enhanced movesets that deal much more damage than you're used to, superior attributes that give them a significant advantage, or underhanded tactics that take you by complete surprise and just feel… cheap. Despite already having numerous advantages, these cheap actions often help to turn the tide in their favour, and they explain why these bosses are often feared in the first place. As we look at the Final Fantasy franchise, there are numerous examples of bosses who have exhibited this kind of cruel behaviour. And today, we are going to be running through seven who we have cherry-picked due to how dastardly they are. But we are going to be drawing a line. Bosses found within MMOs will be excluded, as even though there are some really nasty pieces of work like Pandemonium Warden, there are just so many found within that specific genre, you could probably make an entire list from that subject alone. So for now, we are going to be focusing on the offline, and we're going to be kicking things off with Zodiac from Final Fantasy XII. As it was based around the signs of the Zodiac, Final Fantasy XII had 12 base espers, and each one was aligned with a traditional star sign. Chaos, for example, was associated with Taurus, and Ultima was associated with Virgo. But as had been the case within Final Fantasy Tactics, where there was a secret 13th Orosite called Serpentarius, within Final Fantasy XII there was a secret 13th Esper called Zodiac. This was associated with Ophiocus, the name that has now succeeded Serpentarius, and it could be fought as an optional boss within the Hen Mines. Now, what made Zodiac so cheap was that if you weren't fully prepared, the battle could be over almost as soon as it began. And that's because upon entering the arena where Zodiac could be found, it would cast Dark Jar, a powerful dark elemental attack that had the chance to inflict an instant KO on every character in the party. Not only that, but even if a character was already KO'd going into the conflict, this move could still inflict them with the blind status effect. Zodiac also started the fight with Reflect, Protect, Shell and Haste and could deal massive damage with Banish Ray, a dark elemental attack that would often kill any target that hadn't broken the HP limit. You could try and work around this by having everyone either immune or absorbing dark elemental attacks, but Zodiac would be aware of this and would spam out Dark Jar even more frequently to compensate for your attempts to tactically outmaneuver it. Zodiac also pulled out some other choice moves as the fight progressed. If you had dispelled its reflect status, it would instead use Magic Wall, which would make it immune to magic attacks for 2 minutes. And when it was down to a quarter of its health, it would start using the Shift ability to change its elemental weakness every time it realised the player had figured it out. When in a critical health state, Zodiac then increased its attack power and used Dark Jar even more frequently. It would also become immune to physical attacks and use the Battle Cry ability to make its own attacks even stronger. Basically, Zodiac was mean, and to succeed, as opposed to the fight against Yzmat, where you could just go on autopilot and let your gambits do the work for you, with Zodiac, you would need to be an active participant in the fight. As, for example, doing manual equipment changes mid-fight would make everything go much, much smoother. It meant that all things considered, defeating Zodiac was a significant achievement. Someone else who liked to employ a nice slice of instant KO was Orphan, the final boss in Final Fantasy XIII. After fighting your way through the rather lengthy Eden dungeon, you were left to square off against Bartandalus for a third and final time. And your reward for eradicating this troublesome foe was an encounter with Orphan, the Falci who acted as the source of Cocoon's power. 
Throughout the first part of the fight, Orphan would switch between two forms called Consummate Light and Consummate Darkness, and when it did, it would use Merciless Judgment, a move that inflicted fractional damage that could leave party members vulnerable, especially if they were poisoned. It was annoying, but manageable, and if the fight stayed like that, it wouldn't have been too bad. But that brings us on to the second phase of the fight. To mix things up, Orphan merged its forms and could use Merciless Judgment without any advance warning. This was rough, but again, still manageable. What wasn't manageable was a new move it gained access to called Progenitorial Wrath. When used by Orphan, this would see its assigned target have a 50% chance of succumbing to instant death. You could reduce this effect down by using 3 Cherub Crowns, but even with this reduction, there was still a 13% chance of instant death happening. Still not great odds, but that's not even the cheap part. That came if your party leader was the unfortunate target of Progenitorial Wrath, as due to an infuriating piece of game design, when the party leader fell, it was game over. You could be as prepared as you wanted and do everything right in the fight. But thanks to Progenitorial Wrath, you could still lose and there was nothing you could do about it. The third boss on our list is the Magic Master from Final Fantasy VI, who was both frustrating and cheap. This particular boss was fought at the top of the Cultist Tower, and what made this fight tough was not just the fight itself, but also the arduous journey to the top. Upon entering the tower, you would encounter a unique mechanic, whereby all commands, other than item and magic, were disabled. This led to players having to adapt pretty quickly to the new situation, especially as enemies in this particular location used these restrictions to their advantage, raining down increasingly powerful spells upon would-be thieves. You could cast Reflect or use the Reflect Ring to try and negate the damaging effects of these spells, but enemies would attempt to adapt their attack patterns to try and take advantage, as they would also have Reflect cast on themselves as an innate ability. It meant the Cultist Tower was a gruelling dungeon, especially as there were no save points throughout and teleport was not allowed. And as you progressed, it could lead to second guessing your progress and setup if you did not know what was coming. Enter the Magic Master. After making it to the top of the cultist tower, you were surrounded by cultists, and one, who looked rather different to the others, approached alone. It was an unwelcome sight, and the Magic Master showed no pity, raining down high-level spells at every opportunity. Thankfully, most of his attacks could be negated by using Reflect or the Reflect Ring, but for those devilish enough to try and thwart its power, the Magic Master had one trick left up its sleeve, Ultima. Unlike many other spells in the game, Ultima could not be reflected, and upon being defeated, the Magic Master would cast it, hoping to take the party with them into oblivion. To survive, you would either need to cast Re-Raise on the entire party, be at an extremely high level, or jump out of range at the right time to avoid it. But the only way to know when it was coming would be to keep casting Libra over and over again. It was a brutal end to a brutal dungeon. But no matter how brutal it was, nothing compared to the brutality of Wygraf from Final Fantasy Tactics and everything that surrounded one particular fight against him at Riavana's castle. This sequence of events broke the boundaries of what it meant to be cheap, as it wasn't just a particular mechanic within the fight that was cheap, it was the scenario the game itself presented that was cheap, and Wygraf just happened to be at the centre of it all. Prior to transforming into Belias, Wygraf would swear off against Ramza in a duel. By this point in the game, Wygraf was a level 28 white knight and wore a full set of diamond equipment. It meant he was tough as nails, and his job saw him gain access to a full complement of Holy Knight abilities, but in addition, he also had Safeguard, Move Plus One, and Counter. 
It made for a rough duel, and if you didn't have the right equipment or skills, it was near impossible to win. What was cheap about this particular situation though, was that if you encountered this scenario and had saved right before the fight, there would be no chance for you to go back to either level up more or purchase new equipment to try and level the playing field. In other words, your save would be unwinnable and you would be forced to restart the game from the beginning. Should you have been able to progress past that initial fight though, Wygraf would transform and the remainder of your party would join the fray. But you could then encounter the exact same scenario, as the difficulty ramped up even more thanks to Belias summoning Cyclops and his minions using spells like Unholy Darkness. It was a cheap move from the game itself, locking players into unwinnable battles, and the only way to circumvent this scenario from occurring was to always keep multiple save files with various states of progression so that you could backtrack and better prepare. The next devilish foe on our list is Ruby Weapon. This super boss was added into Final Fantasy VII for its release outside of Japan, and it appeared in the small desert in the Gold Saucer area after Ultimate Weapon had been defeated by the party. In a basic sense, Ruby Weapon was tough due to its high defense and powerful moves. It could nullify most attacks that did not ignore defense or have a fixed damage output, and Ruby Ray and Ruby Flame, in addition to its gravity-based attacks, would pose significant problems. It also used its tentacles to confuse and frustrate players. Dealing with all of these elements was tricky, but Ruby also had numerous other cards up its sleeves to turn the tides in its favour, some of which were just downright unfair. For example, the battle would always start as a back attack. It meant you would start with no ATB gauge and Ruby Weapon got a damage boost on its physical damage output until it was struck. Due to its tentacles, it was also not possible to escape. You could defeat the tentacles in an attempt to try and make the fight more manageable, but Ruby would then retaliate by using Whirl Sand. If you went into this fight without knowing what to expect, Whirl Sand would have been a real kick in the teeth as it permanently removed a party member from the fight. This would immediately ruin most strategies and it was incredibly cheap. As time has progressed though, many have found that the best way to try and circumvent Ruby's frustrating moveset is to actually only fight with one character, turning them into a one-man army and blasting Ruby out of this world with massive damage. In fact, there are now so many different ways to beat Ruby Weapon successfully, it kind of makes you appreciate how much depth the Final Fantasy VII battle system actually has. After talking about Ruby Weapon, we're going to stick with the theme and focus on another super boss that was added after the initial version of the game had shipped. The Final Fantasy III Remake on the Nintendo DS featured a whole host of improvements and one of them was an unnamed optional dungeon that could only be accessed after receiving all four letters from the old four men and Prince Aelus, defeating all the bosses in Eureka, opening approximately 80% of the game's treasure chests and completing the three other optional dungeons. Once inside the super dungeon, you would square off against a whole host of powerful enemies, but the Iron Giant was by far the most troublesome. In addition to having formidable stats and a huge amount of HP, what made the Iron Giant so tough was how cheap it was in comparison to anything else fought within the game. For one, whenever the Iron Giant attacked, it could inflict various status ailments. It also attacked four times per turn, meaning it could wreck a party without you even having the chance to respond. Once approximately 65% of its health had been depleted, the Iron Giant would then switch up its moveset using Swipe, which would hit every party member, dealing a significant chunk of damage. It was rough, but with the right preparation, some of these advantages could be nullified, such as having ribbons equipped or placing everyone in the back row and raining down magical hellfire. And that brings us nicely onto the final cheapster in this list, the one and only Ozma. This super boss has become renowned thanks to the unique mechanics present within Final Fantasy IX. 
Unlike many other games in the franchise, which have seen super bosses sporting huge amounts of HP, locking players into tense battles that could last for hours, Final Fantasy IX was much more focused on short-term encounters that were hard as nails. Osma only had 55,535 HP, and if you were lucky, you could technically win within 6 turns of the fight commencing. But there were so many obstacles thrown in your way that even if you did everything right, in theory, you could still end up staring at a game over screen. One of the things that made Osma so tough was that it would change its behaviour based on how you set up your party. For example, if you had your party set up to absorb or nullify elemental attacks or status effects, Osma wouldn't waste any turns casting those spells. And going down this route would seem like a good idea in theory, but it actually made the fight harder as Osma would become more focused. And this was because with less moves to use, it would increase the probability of Osma casting Meteor. Much like the standard version of the spell, this would deal a random amount of damage. But Osma's enhancement was that the spell wouldn't ever miss, and it had the chance to deal 9,999 damage to the entire party, which would lead to an instant game over if you were unlucky. Outside of this unfortunate situation, Osma also had a few other unfair advantages. For example, it could work outside the established ATB system. When it was charging, any action performed against Osma would lead it to instantly receive a turn, making it extremely difficult to have more than one turn in a row before Osma performed a move of its own. Osma could also perform counter-attacks, with one counter in particular seeing it cure itself for a huge amount of HP. It meant that, with the way Osma was configured, it was not just a simple fight, and successful runs could even last over 10 minutes. It meant that Osma was an incredibly cheap boss, and if you've defeated it, give yourself a big pat on the back. Now even though we've featured 7 cheap bosses here, there are of course many others that have featured over the years, and we would love to hear your thoughts on ones that caused you grief as well. If there are some really strong suggestions, who knows, we may even make a follow up video. For now though, we hope you really enjoyed this trip down memory lane, and if you did, then please do consider hitting that like button and subscribing to our channel. Alright guys, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.